quick introduction. I'm Joe from Joe's Black Book, and um, Sean's kind of working here behind the scenes, but he's the one who came up with this idea of the sessions, and, and people have really been enjoying them. So we're on session number nine, and we have um, style icon Nick Wooster, who also is a fashion consultant. He, you know, worked at Barney's, Bergdorf's, Neiman Marcus, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, Tom Brown. That's what happens when you turn 60. You have all this life experience. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And, you know, Nick is best known for his um, street style. I'm sure many of you have seen him photograph, whether that be at Pity or some of the shows or just on New York streets. But um, he'll be chatting today with um, Jay and Todd Greenfield of Greenfield Clothiers. Um, they have uh, been described as the best tailors in the U.S. and have um, uh, tailored suits for six U.S. presidents, celebrities. They've, they've done um, Joaquin Phoenix and the Joker um, and many athletes. So I think we're going to have a great conversation and, and um, Nick and um, Jay and Todd have worked together over the years so they, they know each other through, through work. And um, just so you guys know, if you have any questions throughout the session, just type them in the chat box. And if we have time um, near the end or throughout, um, we'll try to get to some of those questions. Um, and we may not, but um, I think nonetheless, it'll be a great conversation. So Nick, I'm gonna let you um, run with it. All right, thank you. Um, hi everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, say hello to Jay and Todd and to uh, speak a little bit about Taylor clothing. So tell me what it was like to grow up in a relatively famous household where, um, you know, your father was dressing presidents, athletes, Hollywood royalty. Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, what was that like for you guys? I would say on a day-to-day -day basis, we really weren't so aware of all of that. I mean, a lot of what he did on a daily basis was about working in the shop to produce the clothing and how it should be made. And, you know, I guess way back then, a lot of the work came through other stores where they would send the orders and then going back to his 3G days. And then in 1977, when he started Martin Greenfield, you know, these stores would measure and fit customers and we would do all the making of the clothing. So it was a little bit more about the manufacturing, the tailoring, uh, suit by suit than dealing with the individuals way back. And I guess over time, you know, certain families and friends, we started taking care of people like on Saturday mornings and only like family and friends. And that's kind of grown over the years. So we've gotten a great deal of experience. We always love making clothing for people, whether directly or indirectly. And today the business has really moved toward directly where we like to do everything ourselves. Right, I mean, I think it is about a DTC moment, direct to customer. I mean, we can talk, we will talk about retail in a minute, but one thing I actually wanted to ask you guys about too was the history. You mentioned a little bit about 3G. Tell me how your father um, came to buy the business and tell me about how he started. Sure. So, you know, my dad was a Holocaust survivor and he came to the United States. He says sometimes with only the dirt under his fingernails, he saw someone win a pot on the ship, a pot of a uh, poker. poker hand. And he borrowed a few dollars from that guy. And that's all the money he had when he landed in America. And then through someone he knew from his town that was working at 3G's, he got referred to the job. And he started working here in this building that we're standing in, in 1947. He started as a floor boy. He didn't speak English. He went to night school to learn English. He got his citizenship. He worked his way up through the ranks of the company. And eventually he was the production manager. And then in 1977, they decided to close the factory because they didn't think it could be as profitable going forward as it was in the past. 
because clothing was becoming more engineered and uh, the profit margin was going down. And the, his boss decided to close the factory and he, he couldn't understand it. There were people working here, there was an active business. So he bought the business. He borrowed from cousins, from friends, from everywhere he could. He pulled together money, he bought the business in 1977 and he started it back in his own name. Wow, what is, what, this is something I read about, um, floor boy, what did that mean? What, did, what, what was a floor boy? Well, just someone who ran around the shop floor bringing things to people. So if someone ran out of a color thread, he would run to the fourth floor and get the thread from the thread cabinet or if some work needed to be moved from one operator to another so they could be more efficient and just stay sewing, he would move the work around. But as he was doing that, he was watching what everyone was doing. And then one day somebody was out and he said to the boss, you know, oh, I could do that job. And, you know, he worked his way through all the different jobs and he basically taught himself how to tailor the suits. And eventually they made him the manager. It's so incredible. How old were you guys when you started working in the business? So I guess part-time summers and vacations and spending days here goes back to when I might have been, you know, six or seven years old. But I guess somewhere between college and dental school, I started spending a lot of time here and eventually came in in 1982, you know, full-time. And then I kind of campaigned to convince my brother to give it a shot because I realized we needed a lot of help. And, uh, you know, that took about a year and a half or so, and I eventually recruited him. I got fished in. <laughs> well, but, you know, the common denominator, and this is something, I mean, I'll just throw a little bit about myself. I was 16 years old when I started working in a clothing store. I worked on the retail side, you know, not the manufacturing or design side. And um, I think that is probably the single best uh, gift that I was given was the ability to start in an early age and you know floor boy or I did deliveries I would you know clean the bathrooms I would do whatever needed to be done until eventually I could start waiting on customers and and that sort of thing and then eventually started helping them to buy but um you know so obviously the business has is has transformed you know unbelievably in the in the lifespan of your father and even in the lifespan of, of each of us of, of you guys what um how would you describe you know the business today versus 10 or even 20 years ago so i guess the original structure of the business was really geared to working behind the scenes as a maker for either private label for department stores or specialty stores or also, and then that, that branched into making designer clothing as well. You know, so a designer would work with us to create their own model, and then we would make that with them and it would be sold and distributed to retailers. Uh, so we had this ability, we always made one method of making clothing, that it was always a hand tailored traditional, you know, how we build a, a jacket, a pant, it's all one way. But we delved into some technology early on, which enabled us to like generate new patterns, but be able to make different styles in the same method. So we could make a suit for Neiman Marcus, a suit for Barney's, a suit for Saks, and they could all look different and have their own style and pattern, but all have our, our hand tailored canvas quality to them. So that was kind of our expertise to be able to make you know, not mass production, but hand tailored garments, but to be able to do different types at the same time. And always custom was important in all of those areas. So, right, like every designer, whether it's Alexander Julian or uh, Donna Karen or Rag and Bone or Band of Outsiders, they all want to make custom clothing in their look for celebrities. So, Custom clothing was always a part of our business since the beginning. But, you know, in the last 10 years, we've transitioned to where we're doing much less ready to wear 
and almost all customs, and also less through other sellers and more direct to the consumer. So the main part of our business now is individuals coming to the factory to get suits direct uh, and custom. But there's also a big component of TV and movie designers that we make the clothing for, for like Boardwalk Empire or Gotham. And then there's also retail stores and designers that we also produce for. So uh, that's mostly the transition was no one knew necessarily who was making it. We were just the maker. Like I remember Alexander Julian won some award and he introduced my father and my brother and I as his makers. He was like, I want you to meet my makers. So, you know, that's how we were like, behind the scenes back then, but eventually we noticed the brands were publicizing that we were making the suits for them. So that's when we learned that our name had a, had a value also. Like as the clothing business kind of evolved in America, you know, years ago, there were many different levels of clothing makers from like a grade six make to a grade one make as some were more engineered, some were more hand tailored, and there were many options of how you could have a suit made in America. But over time, you know, the more engineered type of clothing tended to be price oriented and you could always go somewhere else that was a more modern factory that could make that same suit less expensively and faster, or you could go somewhere where the labor cost was lower to make it less expensive. And, you know, over time, there were less and less options of where like some designer could get a suit made in America. And, you know, it got to the point where like, if you're not making it here at Martin Greenfield, you know, where are you making it? There's really not that many options. The few makers that did exist, you know, make their own brand or their own style. So they're not so open to make new styles and different things. So they focus on what they're doing. And we were more open to doing many different things. So that's why we had many experiences through many different designers and stores. And that was that sort of our niche that, you know, we could make different styles. And so uh, most of the great makers in America, like Oxford Clothes or Hickey Freeman or those brands only made their own model, only sold through their own sales channel. And so there was no domestic maker for young designers or for other people to use. And that was our niche that we found that, you know, we were capable of making all different styles. And that's what, that's what pushed us into the costume business because costume designers need all kinds of stuff. I mean, the outfits we made for Gotham were like half cartoon-ish. And then we need to do period work for the Boardwalk Empire or Great Gatsby or the Nick. So we, we have the patterns actually here existing go, going back for many years. Them. I mean, kind of the show business getting really into it started with, you know, John Dunn coming to us to do Boardwalk Empire and came with the research of like, it's, it was going to take place in 1920 and to be able to recreate clothing styles of 1920. And, you know, he managed to come up with all kinds of actual research and actual garments and illustrated style books because there was no color photography at the time. So to able to show the textures and colors and styles. And it was the same thing as when we worked with a designer like a rag and bone that would come to us with a sketch of something and say, this is a new silhouette that we want you to make for us. And we would be able to work with our pattern making and design patterns that look like something unique. So in this case with 1920s clothing, which was actually 1917, 18, because what people would wear in 1920 was something they would have had to maybe have from 1917, 18, 19. So we developed different models of like, 
what would the most sophisticated people wear at that time? What would a gangster wear at that time? What would a wealthy New York gangster wear? What would an FBI type of agent wear? So we created these different models and silhouettes. And then we use our skill like what we've been able to do with custom clothing is take a person's measurements and then fit whatever style we want onto that person. So here they would bring us an actor like on a Monday and say, this person, whatever his like part is and who he should look like. So together we would pick the right model and fabric and style. And then we would have to very quickly, you know, for each episode, come up with outfitting all these people in all these different styles and have consistency where, you know, the Chicago gangsters had one style, the New York gangsters had a different style. And, you know, that was, you know, where my father in the past was hesitant to work with Hollywood and movies because of the speed necessary. You know, we kind of found that a challenge and found a different way to do it. And if, yes, if we're going to make something in one week compared to six weeks, it could cost a little more. It does cost a little more. And, you know, we tried to like encourage them to give us more time at less cost. And we kind of transitioned to this type of, you know, different model of business, but still doing what we know how to do, measure a person, create a style and make it make the person look good in that style. So great. I mean, tell me, um, obviously, I want to talk about clients that you have today, presidents, athletes, you know, I want to get into that. But I did want to ask, uh, or did want to ask about who was the designer that you worked with the longest throughout the history of that period? Because I associate you with one designer, but I'm curious if it's that one. Well, a lot of like, Donna Karen, we had a very long run with until the company went public. And, you know, I guess the new philosophy was that they didn't want to own the business. They wanted to license it. License it, and right. it wasn't for us. So that kind of faded away after a very good, successful business. Uh, also, a long business with Band of Outsiders was probably like our favorite type of clothing to make. I mean, working with Scott Sternberg and when he came to us, he was specifically searching for, you know, at that time, the trend to like very fitted, smaller clothing. So he recognized that if most clothing is machine sewn and fused together, it's not so comfortable to wear when it's tight. When it was loose and drapey, you could get away with it. But in, in order not to feel like you're in a straight jacket, the hand quality and the full canvas in a tight fitting garment was very advantageous. He recognized that and came to us to achieve that. But then he also felt it was important at that time to emphasize that the clothing was made in a hundred year old factory in Brooklyn, New York, and featured us on a hang tag of every garment to like, you know, show the workmanship behind the design of the clothing. So that was a great collaboration for us. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was Donna Karen that I associate. I mean, that's the one that for me, you know, I don't want to say legitimize you, but really gave, I mean, Donna was so um, thrilled to work with your father and, and proud. And I, she really made, you know, we were the, not the first sort of buyer at Bergdorf's, I was a buyer then, but um, in the second season. And, you know, she specifically came with your father and, and talked all about the clothing. And so for me, the two are linked um, in, in such a great way, which dovetails, I believe, because at the time I know, uh, Bill Clinton was the president, and it was, um, I, 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 that's again what I sort of understood about how you guys were dressing presidents, which I think is so, such an interesting topic to talk about today, uh, this year. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about that. What was, you know, what are those experiences like? Are they, I'm sure they're each one different, but is there, there's probably also some consistency um, to that. Well, say going to the White House is an amazing experience, no matter who's the president. And, you know, it's like, you know, for a person who makes clothing to be making clothing for the president of the United States is like our Super Bowl. Like it doesn't get better than that. It's have our clothing, you know, for the most prominent person in the country and in the news and then like on TV and papers every day is terrific. So back when it was Bill Clinton, I guess, Donna Karen had some relationship with Hillary as far as clothing, helping her with clothing. And once she delved into this men's 
couture line that we were doing. So it was suggested that she could help dress Bill Clinton. And, you know, I got some phone call and I was in Italy at the time at the Itty Biella show. And with my, Daryl. With Daryl and Daryl Osborne. And, of you know, course. So like the next day, my father had to fly to the White House and, you know, meet Bill and get him measured up for all these important events and things. And, you know, he had like the most amazing experience there that he still talks about today. And, you know, but that was, you know, crepe suits with a whole drapey nature. And I think with Bill's history of liking from warm up suits to leather jackets and more comfortable clothing, he really loved the feel of these crepe, comfortable, drapey type suits. And, uh, you know, he basically made all his clothing throughout his presidency. That was really terrific. Right. Uh, I didn't, my father was the only one at that time who went to the White House with him. Uh, similar kind of case when President Obama, I guess, there was an Ikram Goldman from Chicago who was dressing Michelle Obama. Right. And I guess at some point, and President Obama at that time was still wearing, I guess, Art Chapter Marks clothes that was made in Chicago where that was his history. And at some point, I guess he stumbled upon a very expensive Italian suit that he really liked. And the question was asked, isn't there someone in America that can make a suit this kind of quality? And then through whatever research they had, we were contacted and it led to us going to the White House to meet with him and uh, make some clothing for him, which turned out to be all his clothing for the next seven years or so. I have to say, of all the presidents that I'm aware of, maybe with the exception of Ronald Reagan, but <clears throat> certainly Obama looks the best in tailored clothing, and and that's such a rare, rare thing. I'm sure you, you well, know it's that. Like, it's like the right timing where clothing was in an elegant mode. Uh, we did have some like initial questions. He looked great in clothing, but he's a very traditional person in nature, so he liked conservative clothing. The first conversation, like even the pant was like flat front pants were the style at, even at that point. Uh, but he was comfortable in pleated pants. And we had this like, is it really elegant when a flat front pant has a little lower rise for the president to be wearing? So we were able to start with the pleated pant where he was a little more elegant looking, even if not so modern looking. And he liked the clothing a little easier fitting, as was the style at the time. And, you know, kind of focused on, you know, his navy and his charcoal gray as like very two choices. And over time, you know, I guess I, I, I visited the White House for different fittings over the years, like eight times. And at some point we introduced the flat front pan and, you know, he looked much slimmer in it and more modern in it. And we, we're able to like make that kind of grad, like the first ones we made with two pants, one pleated, one not. Like he called <laughs> his pleated pant like his work suit. He was comfortable in his work suit. So it was like, but his girls made fun of his pants. So he was able to work in his suit and then we gave him two, two pants so he could change into the slimmer pant and do other things in it. So quickly it evolved into all slim pants and he also, worked out a lot and was in really good shape and probably started filling out the suits a little better. It wasn't like we were making them smaller to fit him. He was still good in the waist, but his shoulders like, you know, he just melded into the right look in the suits. It was a pleasure to see him in them. That's so great. And tell me about, you know, working with um, athletes because that must be a challenge, a technical engineering challenge too. So it is, and it's a little, it's not, it's not like, it's exciting for me, say, early on in my business or sometime in the 80s, actually, through Donna Karen, when we did their first custom suit collection, and they decided to have Patrick Ewing as their, like, advertising campaign that he would promote, that if you can make a suit for a seven foot two person, that kind of demonstrates your ability. So we started dressing him, and I got to meet him, and that was like, for me as a Nick fan at the time, it was nothing could have been more exciting. 
And, you know, we still dress him today. He's become a good friend and we followed him for him all and these his years. Son and his dad. His son, his dad, his, you know, his coach. His, uh, but it's terrific. So being, again, like I, when I joined the business, like it was about buyers and department stores and working in the factory in Brooklyn. And it wasn't ever about celebrities and, you know, your people you idolize coming in contact. It wasn't even in my imagination, but as things evolved, we started doing more like clothing gave us the ability to really be exposed to so many things that we love and that were exciting to us. So, you know, maybe that helped me like kind of push the business in one way or another in the places that I enjoyed it the most. And that I enjoy dressing people and helping them with whatever their little nuances are that's what we like use our talents for. Who do you miss from the worlds of retail and publishing in terms of their ability to dress or how they wore clothing? And, you know, I mean, I, I think you've mentioned one already, but. <laughs> well, it's hard to even go to number two from that, but, you know, Daryl Osborne, you know, we know like my whole life. And he was always very close with my dad, like best friends and at every family event. I think when my daughter was born, he was the first one in there to actually hold her and pick her up. And, you know, he had this flair for fashion and style, but, you know, he really could like bring excitement into the business. So we would work with Neiman Marcus and travel to Italy and, you know, have an idea of like, let's focus on some new style or new idea or what do his customers and Neiman Marcus need that they don't have and what can we make? And, you know, each season we would come up with great ideas and, you know, just traveling and learning from him was like, you know, phenomenal experience. For sure. And I associate Richard Bowes with you as well. Nope. Yes. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about um, the experience of having tailored clothing custom made. Like if you're a customer today, Tell me a little bit about the process and the experience that you could expect. So when customers come for clothing, they, they come here, we're standing at the table with the swatch books and try on garments. And you know, the first thing has to start with discussion. Who are they? What are they gonna wear the clothing for? What are their needs? What's the occasion? Or do they run hot or cold? What climate do they live in? Or where are they going to wear the clothing? And so there's a discovery of what's best for them. And then from there, we work the fabric. And we choose the appropriate fabrics for, for their clothes. And then we start trying on garments. And we work the style. So, you know, tighter fitting, looser fitting, shorter, longer, wider lapel, button stand, you know, every detail, pocket details, you know, try, some men know exactly what it is that they want and others are kind of clueless and they need direction. And, you know, often there's like, it's not even the man himself, it's his wife or his partner that, wants to have input into the, what the clothes look like. So, uh, you know, we have to deal with that component also. Uh, and then, you know, we, we, uh, we all agree on what the customer needs and we make the suit and uh, we fit it a second time. Well, you know, what, what really it's about, like know the customer, like most clothing stores or like they have clothing that they need to sell to people. And when a customer comes in, like it's about selling him what you have. And here we tend to show the customer nothing at all. We just want to talk to him and find out what he really needs. And then we help him interpret that. And then we might suggest a fabric or something. And then we work about, you know, building the right look for him. Like, is he conservative? Does he want to be sharp? Does he... Like, does he want to walk into the room and all eyes go to him? Does he want to walk in and blend in through the room? Like, we use our kind of knowledge that we've gained through show business a lot. You know, we, I work with so many different costume designers, and 
you know, we can fit the same actor for a totally different movie or show, and he's not even recognizable the difference in the clothing it could be. And it's the same way with a person, like we could dress him as anything. So it's good to know what he wants to be and what he needs to be. And like that really makes use of our talent. And because we're choosing it, measuring it, making the pattern, following it through the shop, finishing it, fitting it on the customer, then whatever modifications we choose to make back in the same shop by the same tailors doing the same operations. So it's finished in the same brand new perfect way. Uh, and then it's only when we're satisfied with it can that customer wear it. So we get to control the process from start to finish. And that's what we love about it. Like it's all in our hands to do the right thing. I would assume you have a lot of uh, wedding and event kind of um, uh, business. Tell me, do you do you have groomzillas? We have bridezillas. We have, <laughs> we have motherzillas. We have mother. We have all of, all of those things. But on the whole, most of the grooms are are pretty easy. I mean, they need a tuxedo and. You know, either it has to be like on the flashy side or uh, more traditional. And for the most part, that w was up until COVID a, a big component of our business. Obviously, like so many weddings got canceled now. Postponed. And canceled, postponed. And now we're at a point where people are having like a small family wedding and they're using clothes that they ordered because, you know, why not? We had a couple in the Hamptons that had a wedding last weekend and the, they got married. He was wearing his tuxedo. And then they, after the ceremony, he switched to his white dinner jacket and, you know, he used the clothing, but the guests, it was only the family, no guests. So. <laughs> And what is what is the usual timing if you because I think men are really terrible about planning when it comes to things like that. So if you're if you, you know, said, OK, look, or somebody said I need a tuxedo, what kind of timing and what kind of price could they expect? So usually we like to have six to eight weeks. You know, okay. the fastest we've ever made anything under emergency situations is like two days but you have to have the fabric and know exactly what you're doing to do that. So that's odd, but mostly, you know, four to six weeks, we know we're going to try to do a fitting like two weeks before the wedding or the event so that whoever it is, they all think that they're going to get in better shape for the event. And it gives us time to like fine tune it. So it's at, at its perfect, as perfect as it could be for that time. And, you know, we love working with young people and guiding them. Like they'll tell us, where, when, the type of wedding, and then we can help them like what's the most appropriate and get them ready for it. And usually those, that's where we meet new customers. And then after when they come go to work and need a suit for an event, they know us and come back. And then usually we dress those people for many years. Nice. So, tuxedos like? Like they basically are you know, not too much different from our suits. I'd say our average tuxedo is like $1,900. You know, our whole concept is because we're hand tailoring it and there's no designer markup, there's no store markup, there's no salesperson markup. So we can basically sell it to the consumer, you know, whereas our suits that are custom made in different venues throughout the world might start at five thousand dollars for a tuxedo like that you know we can do it for nineteen hundred dollars and you know there's just no markups on it it's just the person's paying and that's what we're making for them yeah it's really it's great value because i a lot of the garbage that you see hanging on racks for thousands of dollars it's it's really shocking um so in the last section, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the future of tailoring, but I also wanted to ask about, because I saw a question flash, I couldn't see the entire question, but I believe it's asking, if you're a kid today or, or any person and you're interested in tailoring, being a tailor, what, are this, what, what does it take to do that today? 
So there's like, there's nuts and bolts of tailoring, which you can take a tailoring class in some of the big cities, like at FIT or Parsons in New York or at uh, Chicago Institute of the Art has a program. I'm sure there's some in LA. So you can take a class on tailoring to get the basics. And then after that, you know, you would have to intern or work at a, in, a, in a sample room or a factory or some kind of a shop. And it does take time. I mean, that's why there aren't many tailors left. I mean, you know, we sort of joke about that if you need a, we need an, a, a good tailor, we have to dig them out of the grave because, you know, in the past, there were a lot of tailors, especially coming out of Italy, there were, Italy used to, people used to work for a tailor for five or six years for free just to learn how to become a tailor. And then they'd go out on their own and they, they became a tailor, but it does take to really get skill and knowledge of all the aspects of tailoring. It, it takes at least a year. It probably takes wow. three or four years. You know, when we look at people to work here, so, you know, people, there are very few people that have, you probably know people who have the complete knowledge, like it's a lot to ask from the pattern making, the design, the fashion, the fabric, the sewing skill, the ability to use a machine versus hand stitching. Like, so it's all different types of people to press the garment. Each one of those is a skill developed over a lot of time. So for us, like we have lots of places to work with lots of people. I mean, again, just backing up a second with three G's and the whole concept of a factory that makes hand tailored clothing, the way we do it is that instead of having like a tailor make a jacket, for instance, like a Savile Row tailor might do, here the concept in 3G pay was to take 108 tailors and each one made a small part of the jacket, but they made it in the same handmade fashion that the tailor could make it on his own, except the person who just sews the breast welt into every jacket becomes really, really good at sewing the breast welt and can do it much more efficiently and nicer than someone who's just doing it like once a week. So all the parts of our jacket could be made by hand in this like assembly line situation. And that's the system that we've maintained through now. So this is how you attach part A to part B. And it takes a person with great skill and knowledge to do that, but that's their focus. And then other parts of the jacket are made you know, by other people. So to have one person that could make a whole garment and it could be, you know, and it wouldn't take a year to make it and it could like really come out looking great is, is a major accomplishment. That's not so simple to just be so, someone that can make So suits. we evaluate an individual if they're going to be working in the factory about how their eye-hand coordination is, how their finger dexterity is. If you're a good driver, you could be a good sewing machine operator because sewing is all about like looking ahead and ma managing your speed and steering. And so uh, that type of eye-hand coordination is good for a machine operator. But Hand sewing requires you to like sort of crunch up your fingers to hold the needle and push it through. And that's sort of a finger dexterity. And that is a different type of a talent because you don't look far ahead when your hand's sewing. And so that's sort of uh, for, for working, that's sort of how we gauge who could be possibly good at what. So you could use you could you could use truck driver you could use drivers for machine and you could use plastic surgeons for the hand sewing. That's right. In fact, my father did one time. He was away in the country and someone had an injury and my father had to sew the wound up. It happened that the person who had the injury, his our cousin was a surgeon, so but it was in his back, so he couldn't do anything. But he had the equipment and the thread and the needles and he knew my father could sew so he basically said martin you can do it and uh i remember my, the story my father asked my mother for some whiskey and they thought he was going to pour it on the wound but he drank it because he was shaking 
And, you know, he stitched them up and stopped the bleeding. And, uh, you know, so there is some relation there. That's such a brilliant story. I love that. You know, I'm going to put Joe on the spot because I saw some questions flash, but I couldn't read the entire question. So, Joe, is there a question that um, you think is interesting that someone's asking out there that we should ask uh, Jay and Todd? Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I actually have some questions. One of the questions, and you guys kind of touched on it, was, you know, I, I've always known um, of Savile Row in England as, you know, notorious for tailoring. What are, the, what are the differences, sorry, that's my dog. What are the differences between Savile Row and how they approach tailoring versus how you did? You kind of talked a little bit about the assembly line, but are there any other differences in how you would make suits here in the States versus over in England? So the construction part is very, very similar. We, we both use full canvas. We both do a lot of hand sewing of all the different components. We both do a lot of shaping of the cloth with the iron, with steam, as we're making the garment. But what's different about it is the design part. So a Savile Row tailor typically has a pattern and adapts that pattern to fit the customer, and then through the fitting process, makes it fit better and better. And because we have sophisticated uh, design computer capabilities, we're able to choose the style and offer different styles, and then we do all that pattern work and create a unique pattern for each suit, for each individual. And so we believe we can, we can vary the style in a, in, a, in a different way than they can in Savile Row, but there isn't really much difference besides that. Mm -hmm. I actually want to ask a question. Um, what about like what I would call something like torture tailoring? Do you work with anybody currently that, you know, asks you to do experimental things like wash suits or, you know, put them out on the line to dry or really screw with the technique? Or is that something that you would really don't want to do? Well, my father used to refuse to do odd things like that as soon as he heard about it. But my brother and I are a little more open to it, and we've done a lot of different things. We made jackets where the lapel edge was cut so it was frayed and open. And I remember a recent, well, two, maybe two seasons ago on the blacklist, they asked us to make reversible jackets because James Spader was going to go into a, a, a scene wearing a tuxedo house. in an opera house, and then he had to duck into the stairs and turn his jacket inside out and be a security guard. So, you know, we had like three days to make uh, reversible tuxedo security guard jackets that would fit James Spader and who was the other, <laughs> Brian? Was it, who was the other actor? Another That's actor. Yep. And, you know, first we had to figure out how to do it. And it was such a rush. We, cut apart two jackets to sew them to together, sew them back together to try to see what what the issues would be. And eventually we figured out how to make the lining of one jacket was the shell outside shell of the other jacket. And you know, we were able to do it. Within limits. Like we realized we couldn't have a vent because then it wouldn't be right on both would, sides. Or, right. With a vent that showed it was two different color the jackets. It has to be no buttons and just a sleeve all the way around, but sewn together. But, you know, we could find ways to do things. So we love, you know, for a purpose, it makes sense. Some designers over the years have asked us to do things that really made no, like if it ha makes some sense or it's a neat idea, just because it's new, we're excited to try it. But, you know, within reason, usually. Right. Um Joe, do, were there any other questions that you wanted to ask before we go into the uh, the lightning round? 
Yeah, I have a question on in terms of um, how you're structured in terms of the work, like how many employees are there? You know, I, I know you're standing kind of in the storefront where someone might come in and check out fabrics and whatnot, but the sewers and pattern makers, like how many people are in, in, your, um, uh, in your place? So we right have now? about uh, 60 right now. Uh, not everybody, some of the elderly ones haven't come back to work since COVID, but they're still our employees. We're still covering their insurance. And I'll say like when COVID started, we shut down and then it was so strange to come into the factory with nobody there and it didn't seem right. And so uh, I had seen some YouTube about making masks and we started to make these masks and uh, we brought one or two people in and we started to make masks. And then I got an email out of uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and there was an outfit there that had fabric that was suitable for hospital gowns. And they had a cutting system, but they didn't have any sewing capability because they usually cut and send out. So they were looking for sewers in Brooklyn and we started making hospital gowns and we made about, uh, about 8,000 hospital gowns in a few weeks. And they all went to New York City hospitals. And we donated over 10,000 of these masks to hospitals and people who deliver food to the elderly, uh, Catholic charities, all different places. So, you know, right now our workforce is a little bit less than normal, but... We have should, high hopes to be getting back. We hope to get back to the 80 or so that we were before this started. Great. And then That's Nick, I, I have one, one more question here. Someone, and I know you kind of touched on it guys, but when making a suit for TV or film, how much of the design is the costume designer versus yourself? And do you provide any input, suggest any changes to the final design? Can you think of any outfit where you suggested a big change? Yes. So, you know, it's an interesting dynamic because in some situations, the director like gives the costume designer a very specific design job. Like, this is what you have to get made for this character. In that case, there's not much discussion. It's like, here it is, this is the style, this is the fabric and just make it look like this, but on the character. And so that's one translation where we don't get too much input just to make it fit that and look like that. Sometimes the costume designer is creating something and then it's like more of a collaborative, like she'll say, well, you know, we really want them to look more sophisticated or more, you know, custom. Like, so then we could throw out different details that, you know, like maybe a cuff on the sleeve or different things that like you don't see every day to help, you know, use our tailoring ability. And then sometimes when the actor is a producer on the show, then technically the costume designer works for the actor. A lot of them try to like, then the actor wants to dictate how he should dress. So in a lot of those cases, I become like the go-between where I know what they're trying to work. Like Russell Brand, for instance, we dressed him in Arthur. Arthur. And co costume designer, Juliet Krause, who we worked with many years, like she had, he was supposed to be wearing his father's Savile Row custom clothing that was altered for him. And then Russell was like, I want low rise skin tight pants and wouldn't wear anything that was like, so, you know, there was like, I show him like working buttonholes on the sleeve. And I said, you know, you can open these buttonholes and that's like a custom suit like idea. And then before you know it, he was rolling up his sleeves in every scene so he found things that he liked about the custom tailoring that he knew nothing about. And like, I'd have to like, okay, it's tight, but not that tight and, you know, get involved. And certain cases like with the Joker and Joaquin Phoenix, we worked with a designer who had a very specific idea of what he wanted. And it was, you know, it's much easier for us to make a fitted suit that looks great on a person than something that's supposed to be a little odd in different ways and not really fit perfectly, but yet have some character that we don't even understand. So when he showed us this Joker prototype, 
you know, he said it's going to be like a three-piece suit, but the jacket doesn't match the pants. The vest doesn't match the jacket. It's like, but it may be in the same fabric, but it's going to look, you know, odd in many ways. And he had an idea of what the lapel should look like. And so we tried to create that for the first fitting. And while we were like trying to make that shape of lapel, we messed up and it didn't come out the way we wanted it to. It came out like wider than it should have been, but it was the day to fit him. And that's what we had because we were working really fast. But when we put it on, they absolutely loved that lapel, and that became the Joker suit, like on the 20 or so more of them that we made as duplicates for the violent scenes and everything. So by mistake, we created something that was terrific. But got nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah. So fantastic. All right, Joe, are we good to go to the uh, lightning round? Let's do it. And don't forget to mention Eunice at the end, okay? Thanks. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, Todd and Jay, what are the three items you can't live without? And they can be anything. Giant football. Is that an item? Well, it's... Something. Yeah, three things. Okay. So, I'll, I'll go with... Uh, the factory and working six days a week. <laughs> it, it's what we love. Okay. What are your favorite restaurants in New York City? So I'm going to go Roberta's right here in Brooklyn, whereas it used to be Peter Luger's. It's definitely evolved to Roberta's. And so I have to go Roberta's number one also, just because they're right around the corner from us and uh, my office has a window and I can tell when they light the pizza oven in the morning and the smell sort of tries to drive me over there. I have to agree with you. Um, favorite bars in New York City? I've been spending a lot of time this past couple of years. We've been working out of the Mark Hotel and I really, that's a great bar right at the Mark Hotel. And we have the pine box near, near the factory here. And that used to be a casket factory. And when, when it got rented to the bar, it still had a bunch of uh, wood inside. And they, they lined the walls of the bar with the pine wood from the caskets and called it the pine box. And it's, it's a great place. That's a, I love that. Um, if there was anywhere in the world you could travel right now, where would it be? I would be in San Tropez where I was supposed to be this summer, but of course it got canceled out. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to say Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And uh, that's because my daughter's over there and she's been uh, away for a while, so I miss her. Ah, uh, that's sweet. Do you ever wear sweatpants and sneakers? Not sweatpants, sneakers almost every day, lots of jeans, but not sweatpants. I never wear sweatpants. I don't own a pair of sweatpants, but I do wear sneakers often. I mean, I'm active walking around the factory all day long, and sneakers are uh, important for me. And sneakers and suits are very trendy, so. <laughs> okay, double-breasted or single-breasted on a suit jacket? So I go single-breasted, but with a vest. Okay. I'm really a proponent of three-piece suits. I think most men look way better with a vest, and it gives them the flexibility to take the jacket off and still have the option of a vest. So uh, we, we make lots of vests for people here. And I, I go single-breasted, but I this one doesn't have it, but I often put a peak lapel on a single-breasted, and that gives a little dress-up look. And... Uh, it's still comfortable to wear it, but I it. I love it. Um, what is your favorite suiting fabric? So mine is definitely Laura Piana Super 150's Winter Tasmanian, it's called, but it's a year round cloth. And it has a very high, like kind of luster and great feel to it, but it has great body. So it's pretty wrinkle resistant and you can wear it in all weather. So that's my favorite suit cloth. And for me, I usually go with a vintage fabric because we have 
a whole floor full of fabric here, which you might have seen on Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which they film in our factory, the factory scenes. They were hunting for some treasure and they were looking through the floor with all the rolls of fabric. And so for me, I like to just find an old piece of fabric that I like the feel of and the look of. And I, I always use what I find on hand. <laughs> I love that. For me, it's gray flannel or gray tropical. Okay, last question. If you could hang out for a weekend with any of the clients you have worked with, who would it be? Well, we recently did the, the costumes for the David Byrne Broadway show, and I got to spend some time with David, and I spent some time with him years and years ago when I was a stagehand in the mid-'80s. I, uh, I met him and, and spent some time with him, so now I... He, he knows me well, and we've spent quite a few times together sort of recently, and I got to go with him because I'm a huge fan of Mr. <laughs> That's amazing. I would probably say James Spader because, I don't know, we really, like, come face to face, and, like, he, he looks at me, like, same age, and, like, how would you make me look as good as I can, and He's just a really interesting person to talk to. So I think like that would be thrilling. And he's, he goes way back. On the first season of Blacklist, he was here getting a fitting for, for the clothing. And he asked if we could, he could, they could use the factory as a location to shoot part of an episode of Blacklist. So I said, sure. So he was walking out the door and someone called and they wanted to come over and scout the place. And then in episode, season one, episode three, five, there's a scene where all hell is breaking loose and the FBI is there and he turns to the FBI guy and he says, you have to take me to my tailor. I have a fitting on my suit. And he comes <laughs> here and he has a fitting here with my dad as his tailor. And they don't have my dad's name, Martin, in the script because if they use his name, then they have to pay a higher scale and then it's a whole thing so we he rehearses the scene and he says martin do the pants feel a little tight and they say james stay on script please and he rehearses it like three or four times and each time they correct him and then he did a few takes of the scene and every time he said my father's name and so <laughs> on air you see him getting fitted by my dad and and he calls him martin did he get a sad card for it he didn't get a card, but it, he got uh, listed as a character on that episode. I love it. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure getting to learn a little bit about each of you and uh, where you guys are today. So I thank you for your time. Joe, I thank you for asking me to participate and uh, join us next time for session 10 with Eunice Lee. All right. Great, thank you so much. everybody.